So anyway, I, I'm by nature interested in preventing disease, helping children and caring about how I eat for lots of different reasons. And so I, uh, my whole career has been public health nutrition and grant writing and um, holistic healing. And I didn't know anything about oxalates. <laughs> my textbook that I studied at Cornell had two paragraphs and, and chapters and textbooks are written by a series of authors. Each chapter is written by a different set of people. And then there's an editor that tries to tie it together. So in one chapter, there's a list of 10 foods. In another chapter, there's a list of 10 foods and they don't match. Um, and they're, they're literally this much space in the book twice, one for one chapter one, like they're an inch and a half long and the columns are tiny. So barely talked about oxalate. What I learned at Cornell, where I got my nutrition degree, which is considered one of the finest nutrition schools on the East Coast, um, I learned that if you have tea with dinner, the oxalates in the tea will block the calcium absorption. So don't eat, don't have your tea with dinner. <laughs> that's, that's what I learned about oxalates. And that of course, kidney stones are made with oxalate and, and renal patients should not be eating oxalate foods. But we never really got into it at all. And um, I really had no idea about any of the stuff that I have since researched. And I had to research it for myself because my health had been crashing starting at age 12, but was progressively crashing to the point where I became disabled in 2010 had to quit my faculty job at the local university here and have a hysterectomy. I didn't recover well from that hysterectomy. My endocrinologist was trying to help me with the fact that I don't have ovaries anymore and sent me to the sleep doctor because all my labs were perfect. I looked fine. I looked amazing on paper and even in person because I'm fit. And the big problem that doctors are seeing is obesity and things like that. And I don't look sick because I'm not fat and diabetic, but the sleep doctors fancy, you know, they hook you up with wires they, all over your head and arms and legs, and they're measuring your twitches and movements and your brain activity. And the sleep study showed that my brain was in arousal 29 times an hour. How <laughs> 29 that? times an hour. So that means that at best I could get two minutes of sleep at a time. That's not sleep, which would explain why I could no longer work. <laughs> like, I was struggling so hard to focus and I was doing grant writing, like really good brain work with a brain that never slept. And that's wow. why I had to quit. And I it got to the point where after my hysterectomy, I could not exercise. I could not read the mail. I no longer had any mental energy left to do anything. And I was completely useless. And my, I was like doing everything I can to understand what causes this brain toxicity. That's a brain toxicity problem when your brain can't sleep. And the literature suggests it's SIBO, you know, that you've got overgrowth of bacteria in your intestinal tract. And those bacteria produce a lot of toxins as they die in their life cycle. And they can poison you to a certain degree. And so you have this endotoxemia that's supposed to be the main cause of sleep disorders. Well, I had all the bloating and all the symptoms of SIBO, but the test said I didn't have it. I, the, there's no methane production or none of those compounds from these supposed overgrowth, but I didn't have any other theory. So I needed it. I needed to, I convinced the doctor to prescribe the drugs for SIBO uh -huh. And uh, also tried to work on the chronic constipation that I had because I figured between SIBO and constipation, if I could fix those, I could sleep again. And then I could maybe read the mail. <laughs> and so trying to fix all that, I started to look for like, I've done every diet over the years. I know all the like therapeutic diets. I know a lot of holistic healing. I've tried them all. I've been in chelation and I've been in vitamin C IVs and I've done all the acupuncture and the massage and the, I spent uh, $3,500 or more on homeopathy. You know, I've done it all for myself and I'm an expert in holistic healing. So I knew everybody and I knew the best people to see and they all wanted to help me get better. And no one helped me, nobody. And it turned out in my quest to sleep again, 
I tried this kiwi experiment where kiwis help cure constipation. <laughs> it was eating two kiwis every day starting in like August of 2013. And by October, through my Bikram yoga, because I was still dragging myself to Bikram yoga, and that is a situation where you have exact same conditions and exact same poses and exact same timing every time. So the, the experience is the same, but you change. Each time you experience it, it's a different experience. And I found the changes that was happening to me, I was getting more arthritic, stiffer and stiffer, less able to do the poses over this summer of doing the Kiwi. And one night in October or November, I'm laying in bed thinking, what the heck has got this arthritis going again? Because all through my 20s, it started, you know, in my teens, I was having lots of rheumatoid arthritis flares. Um, my hands would swell up and be very weak. And I would have trouble with many joints, but especially in the hands where I wouldn't have the strength to turn the key in a knob. Wow. I was, I'm a teenager. I'm 19 and I can't open a door. And so this was coming back. Like I had been tortured by arthritis quite terribly and it had subsided enough that I didn't think, it, you know, it wasn't really a day-to-day -day problem, but in eating the kiwi, it wow. was. And I realized that this arthritis was related to my diet. Finally, I finally saw the connection. I'm 49 years old and I have been eating these high oxalate foods. Kiwi is a high oxalate food. Um, and it is really bad in several ways, but, um, I, I, this was like one of those moments where my world understanding of health and healing here, I've been trying to understand health and nutrition since I was five and I'm almost 50 and I'm having this dawning insight that my healthy foods have been causing my pain, arthritis, and probably fibromyalgia pains forever. And I was like, oh crap, I've got to deal with my sleep problem. And now I have to do this oxalate thing for my arthritis. This is so annoying. It felt like I was being sent down a second path I had to follow while I was still trying to solve my sleep problems. Well, lo and behold, 10 days after I started really getting serious about low oxalate in a better kind of way than I had, I had previously tried it in 2019 and didn't understand it. So I didn't see the benefits of it. The first time, but this like time, 19? I, excuse me, 2009. Thank you yeah. for correcting me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this was 2013, and it was like four years before I had tried the low oxide diet because I had this genital pain mm. that tipped That's me tough. off. Mm. And so now I'm actually doing it better because by now I actually knew about oxalates because thanks to the Volvo Pain Foundation, the Volvo Pain Foundation has been teaching a low oxalate diet for 25 years and they're right near me. And I didn't know about them until 2009. And that got me aware that all my sweet potatoes and you know things like kiwi, but for me, it was Swiss chard and sweet potatoes were high in oxalate and I needed to can it on that, like not live on them like I had been doing. So when I added the kiwi, old symptoms started to resume again. And then when I took it out, not just the, not just the arthritis, but all of a sudden I can read the mail again. And like, I did not expect changing my diet would help with the sleep problem right? in that kind of way. Like I thought oxalate caused maybe kidney stones and apparently genital pain, but I didn't understand the real toxicity of it because we don't get that kind of education in nutrition school or in public health school. And there's yeah. no, been no conversation about it. And so I was so disturbed that someone like me with a lifetime commitment of being healthy, with professional degrees that are highly regarded from fine institutions, and with connections in the holistic healing and functional medicine world, personal and professional connections like crazy, cannot figure out what's wrong with her. No one can help me. I couldn't help myself. I was just thinking, holy cow, nobody has a prayer of figuring this out for themselves because there's nowhere you can turn to hear from a doctor or any health provider or professor or even academic journal that will say, you know what, if you're in chronic pain, you need to not be eating oxalates. And they're still not interested, by the way, because do, do you want to share that story? <laughs> 
if you yeah, want. So here I'm like, <laughs> now I'm, I, I don't have a career anyway. And, you know, my husband's managing to pay the bills. So I have become pretty much a full-time oxalate researcher after this, because my whole commitment that has been in my life since I was a little kid to help people be well through lifestyle and nutrition, got a big needed, had a gigantic hole in the middle of it. Like all the foods we trust, I thought sweet potatoes were a low allergy food that were helping me with my allergies, my reactivity, my, I couldn't do gluten and grains and beans. I needed a starch. I needed something safe. I thought this was a safe food. <laughs> it turned out my safe food has been poisoning me.